Let us bow our heads. Dear God, we are very thankful today for the great outpouring of your presence in our midst already. And we're expecting this exceedingly abundantly this afternoon. We thank you for this marvelous song from this fine Christian woman that's just sang this hymn and your spirit that came down in the interpretation thereof. Lord, let it be so, we pray. And God, I pray that you'll bless each and every one of us and may our hearts be filled with joy when we see this take place. Yeah, that's right, Dear Lord. God, we pray this afternoon, if there be some here that's unprepared to meet you, may this be the hour that they'll make that final decision and will come into thee through the new birth. Grant it, bless all of us, Lord, who's been a long time in the road. We pray that you'll teach us new things by thy word. Give us better understanding by thy spirit, Lord. May he come and interpret the word. The only interpreter we have is the spirit. We pray that he'll grant that to us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That suffices. <laughs> what a time. I don't know any better place to be lest it be in heaven. <laughs> or we are just feeling the anointing of that now. He's setting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Gathered in heavenly places. God bless Sister Florence. And she's going through a time of sorrow and shadows her father just taken and I, I pray God bless that child and brother Demas load on both shoulders and the weight of all these conventions and things he needs our prayers too God bless brother Shakarin brother Carl Williams I'm certainly happy to be here in this convention with you and with all these fine brethren and I had the privilege of meeting some and now, this is my finishing part of the service as far as I know, so well, I expect now to be able to shake hands with some of these fine men and, and get to meet them, or I expect to spend eternity with them in a, in a better land. Uh, just a, a little thing, I hope that I will not be misunderstood, not a coincidence, I do not think, or I, I think it was providential. Uh, yesterday, I was given a present by a friend here uh, from a friend of mine, Danny Henry. He was a boy. One day in the Christian Businessmen's Convention in California, I was having a, a meeting. I was speaking very hard uh, against the, the condition of the time. And I I hope that everybody understands that, that I have evil in my heart. I, that's not that. You, know, you surely understand I don't mean it that way. But I have to just say what comes to me to say. And then after that, this little fellow, a Baptist brother, and I think he's some relative to a movie star. And um, he came down to put his arm around me to say, The Lord bless you, Brother Branham. I just want to offer a word of prayer and he started speaking in French the boy doesn't know one word of French and someone raised up a uh, kind of a big woman from I believe she's in Louisiana she said that's French and then there was a man over there who said that's French and they wrote out what it was I had the original copy here and then happened to be a young fellow walking from the back and coming forward wanted to see their notes and he was a U.N. interpreter of French, just exactly French. And I would like to read this note. This is the original note of one of them, and it was from um, this man that it interpreted. I may not be able to call his name just right. Le Duc, Victor Le Duc. He's a full-blooded Frenchman. Now, here's the message. Because thou hast chosen the narrow path, the harder way, Thou hast walked of your own choosing. Thou hast picked the correct and precise decision, and it is my way. Because of this 
momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven awaits thee. What a glorious decision thou hast made. This in itself is that which will give and make come to pass their tremendous victory in love divine. When I got that, you know, when I first heard people speak in tongues, I, I wouldn't criticize nothing, see, because I've seen it genuine, but I always wondered. But when that happened, and knowing what the commission was behind it, I, I knew it come from God. Then his brother, sitting here, a, a real well-known attorney, uh, gave me a present from Danny. Danny's just left the Holy Land. And he was laying on the tomb, in the tomb, rather, where Jesus had been laying after his death. And when he did, he said he got to thinking of me. And, and the Spirit of the Lord came up on him, and he went out on Mount Calvary, where the crucifixion had taken place, and got a piece of rock. And he came back and made me a pair of cufflinks out of it. And I really cherished them. And now this, of course, Danny doesn't know this. But this morning, while out in prayer, I just looked down at those cufflinks, and each one of them, if you'll notice, is blood-stained and also has a straight line right through each one. And here in the message that he gave from God of the straight and narrow way, how it just fit in just exactly. I thought that was kind of maybe providential, or, and I certainly thank Danny, you tell him, brother, that how I appreciate that. And another strange thing, I asked my wife in the morning, I put on a shirt, had to have a cuff link in it, and she said, I forgot to bring your cuff links. So the Lord had a, some provided for me. <laughs> oh, it's a glorious life, isn't it, brother? Just to walk in the simplicity of, of the gospel. And yet, in its simplicity, it's the greatest thing I know of. I know nothing of it. And being that it was made simple, that uh, I had a chance to come into it, see, to, by the grace of God. Now, this afternoon, I don't want to take much time because I know you're going to churches tonight. And I think all you visitors here should look around on the platform, see these ministers. and dear, all. They'll be glad to have you in their service tonight. They'll do you good. No doubt you went to some Sunday school this morning in the city and... While we're having these conventions and being the full gospel businessman, I think we ought to give all of our support that we can to our churches because that's where our businessman goes. And um, it's a house of God. And I hope you will visit some church tonight. Tomorrow night is the closing of the convention, I believe. And I guess they've announced this speaker, which I aim to be here, the Lord willing, to um, hear his message. God bless each and every one of you. Now, uh, I am don't claim to be a preacher. I'm, I'm kind. I haven't got enough education to call myself a preacher. A preacher, when you say that, they expect you to have a couple of degrees in college, and, and I don't have anything but this little slingshot. See, you know, I, I try to come after the sick sheep if I can to bring them back to the Father's pasture. If I make mistakes, forgive me. I'm not a theologian. I don't criticize theologians. Theolo theology is all right. It's what we need. But sometimes I criticize the condition that we've gotten into. And that doesn't mean to any certain individual. It's just a message. I, I wish I'd, it wasn't mine to give. It tears me to pieces because you know how you feel. What if your own children... See? Don't you hate to have to give a child a scolding, bawling out or something? Oh, I'm a parent too, and I know what it means. And I, I trust that you forgive me. And I want you to do like this. When you're sitting this afternoon, I'm going to ask you a favor. Just got a little short few notes here. As I told you, I have to make write the scriptures out. It used to be I could almost quote the Bible by heart. But not now. I went through too many hard battles. <laughs> Got too old for that. But I trust that, that you'll listen to me just a little while this afternoon and just really open your heart and try to understand what I'm digging at. Then I think it'll be better, especially the pastors of the city and 
different places. Uh, I trust that you'll listen real close. And now you do that, do by that the way I do when I eat my favorite pie, cherry. Some of my favorite meat, chicken. But when I'm eating a fine piece of cherry pie and I hit a seed, I don't stop the pie. I just throw the seed out and keep on eating pie. <laughs> when I hit the bone of a chicken, I don't throw the chicken away. I just throw the bone away. So well, if I'd say something that you wouldn't agree upon any time, just throw that far away. and Well, look at it real good. Be sure it's bone now. <laughs> <laughs> And then may I also say, if it's a seed, remember, it brings forth the new life. Yes, amen. So look real hard, and may the Lord bless. bless it. Yes. Uh, Brother Carl Williams said something the other night about uh, turning loose the praying for the sick, uh, which would be very fine. Uh, I know that would be fine. But we just, we're not fixed here for that to bring a prayer line. And I don't know whether Brother Oral or any of the other brethren has ever had uh, prayer lines in the conventions or not. I don't know. I've tried it two or three times. But, uh, usually, if a crowd like this, you'll have to give out prayer cards, see, in order to do it. Because you can't, it's not an arena, it's the house of God. See, it's dedicated for that. And we, they press and push, and you have cards, you line them up orderly. So Billy asked me, said, Shall I go over and give out cards? People are asking me for prayer cards. I said, no, Billy. Let's just leave the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. Amen. See, Amen. That, see, and Amen. let him maybe build faith and just be healed right there where you're at. Yes. You, but the, see, divine healing is a minor in the gospel. And you can never major on a minor. <laughs> Anyone knows that. But a, it's a bait that's used to get people to believe in the supernatural presence or God, the supernatural is present. And then by that, if they can recognize his presence, then they are healed, see, by faith believing him. Now, I want to read some out of God's Word, the New Testament. And then I want to take a text from this New Testament and uh, this scripture and speak this afternoon on a subject for just a, a little while. And I don't want to keep you too long for the services tonight, but remember, I hope I've made myself clear. Just give it your attention for a while, if you will. Now, before we do this, let's bow our heads again. You know, we could sing too much. We could shout too much till we got hoarse. And we could uh, sing at the wrong time or shout at the wrong time. But here's one thing. We're never out of order. When we're praying, I would that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubt or right. Father, it is the greatest privilege that a mortal ever had was to close his eyes and open his heart and speak to you. And we know that you hear if we could just believe that you hear. For Jesus said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, it will be granted. That was on conditions if we wouldn't doubt it. So, Father, help us to believe this afternoon that our petitions will be granted. And may there be not one shadow of doubt anywhere. But may it come to pass the things that we're asking. And that is, God, for your great name to be honored today by bringing into your kingdom ever lost and straying soul that be under the sound of our voice or at this tape would ever reach. Out into the heathen lands where around the world they go. I pray, Heavenly Father, that there will not be a feeble person in our midst today. When the service is finished, may the Lord God save every lost soul and heal every sick body and fill his children's heart with joy. That's why we have faith, Lord, to ask in Jesus' name to God our Father, because that he promised he would hear, and this is for his glory. Amen. In St. Uh, John's Gospel, the 17th chapter, and beginning with the 20th verse, I wish to read for uh, a text. Uh, 
think that is right. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their words. That I believe I have got the wrong place. Now, excuse me just a moment. I'm looking for Jesus' prayer that, or not Jesus' prayer, rather, but it's for his, uh, I might have got marked down here on my text something wrong. Uh, it's where Jesus prayed that, or was saying that as a woman in travail for birth of her child, birth, childbirth. Is that Luke or John, Jack? Which is that even? 16th of John. I thought that was right, but it didn't sound very much like it. 16th of John. 21st verse. Sure. 21st verse. Sure, here we are. John, St. John 16 and 21. That they may be... No, Brother Jack, that's still wrong. No, John 16 21. 21st verse 16. 2016, 21. I got the 16th chapter of St. John. 21st verse, but it, am I wrong? Well, there's a mess in this mix, in this Bible, yes, sir. Printed they printed it wrong. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know what? That's exactly the truth. Here's a brand new Bible. I've just gotten it, and it's got, it's got the, it's printed wrong. Just, just draw a breath. There's a reason why it was done, and, you, and God will show you something to bring out of this. It's wonderful. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. 1621. Thank you very much. That's true. A woman, when she, barely, barely, I say unto you that you shall sleep, weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and ye shall be sorrowful. Your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman, when she is, is to intervale, has sorrow because her hour cometh. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more anguish, anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Thank you very much, my brother. I sure appreciate that. Now, that certainly is the misprint here in the Bible. The page has been put in wrong. And I just found it on my old Scofield Bible and picked up this one and run up here with it just a few moments ago because my wife just gave me this for a Christmas present. Now, I want to, to speak this afternoon upon a subject that I announced, birth pains. Now, that sounds very bad, but it's in the Bible. I believe that Jesus here was speaking of, as he said, you will have a sorrow but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. Speaking to his disciples here, knowing that the birth of, the, of Christianity was coming into existence. And now the old has to die in order that the new is born. To have anything that gives birth has to have pains of distress. And they certainly was going to go through a pain of distress and anguish to get from the law unto grace. Normal, natural birth types the spiritual birth. All things of the natural is types of the spiritual. And um, we find out, if we look out here on, on the ground and see a tree and the earth growing, is struggling for life, that goes to show that there is a tree somewhere that doesn't die. Because it's, a, it's crying out for something. We find people, no matter how old, how sick, what condition, they're crying out to live because it shows there is a life somewhere where we live. Live forever. Notice how perfect. Now, in 1 John 5, 7, I believe it is, if I'm not mistaken, it said, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. There are three that bear record in earth. That's water, blood, and spirit. And they agree in one. Now notice, the first three are one. 
the second three are earthly, which agree in one. You cannot have the Father without the Son. You cannot have the Son without having the Holy Ghost. But you can have the water without the blood and the blood without the Spirit. I think through our ages has proved this to be true. Water, blood, Spirit, justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That types or makes the or, or the antitype which takes away from the natural birth. Look when a, a woman or anything in travail for birth. The first thing comes to pass, the breaking of the water, a normal birth. Second thing is the blood. And then comes the life. Water, blood, spirit. And that constitutes the normal, natural birth. And so is it in the spiritual realm. It's water, justification by faith, believing on God, receiving Him as your personal Savior, and being baptized. Second is sanctification of the Spirit, that God cleanses the Spirit from all uh, elements of the world and the desire of the world. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and gives new birth and fills up that sanctified vessel. For instance, like this. Now that, I told you what you don't believe. Lay aside and then take the pie. Notice. Now a, a glass is laying out in the chicken yard. You don't just pick that up and put it on your table and fill it up with water or milk. No. But picking it up is justification. Cleansing it is sanctification. It calls the Greek word sanctifies a compound word which means cleansed and set aside for service, not in service, for service. Then when you fill it, it is put in service. Excuse this now, not to hurt. That's where you pilgrim holiness, Nazarenes failed to walk on up into Pentecost. You was cleansed by sanctification, but when you were ready to put in service by the gifts of speaking in tongues and other things, you turned it down. Drop back out in the pen again. See? Now, that's, that's what happens. It always does that. Now, not to criticize you now, but just, uh, I want to get this off my heart. And that's been burning me ever since I've been here. So, I might as well just, if Carl's grace and Demas and them, and you're all, I, I'll try my best to deliver my soul from it. See? That's up to you. Normal typing the spiritual. Now, we find out then and it's fully born when the baby usually now when the water breaks you don't have to do very much about it and when the blood comes you don't have to do much about it but in order to get life in the baby you've got to give him a spanking to make him yell out and um, that's uh, now without education as my brethren here are so well trained to it there's, but I have to take nature to type it. And there you are. That's what happened at taking a real spanking to get this to them. Now, you take a little, some kind of a shock. Maybe you wouldn't have to spank him, but just shock him a little. The very idea of him being born sometimes will do it. Grab him, shake him. If you don't start breathing, spank him a little. And then he yells out. And unknown tongues to himself, I guess, but <laughs> he, uh, anyhow, he, he's making a noise. <laughs> and I think if a baby is born just by, by stillbirth, with no sound, no emotion, that's a dead baby. That's what's the matter with the church today, the system. We've got too many stillborn children. That's right. Uh, they need a gospel spanking, you see. And so, uh, to wake them up, to bring them to themselves uh, so that God can breathe the breath of life into them. And now we find that that's so true. It's crude theology, but it's the truth anyhow. So notice, in a seed's birth, the old seed must die before the new one can be born. So therefore, death is hard anytime. So it's painful, it's distressful. Uh, birth is the same because you're bringing life into the world and it's, it's painful. Jesus said that his word was a seed, that a sower went forth to sow. Now, we're all acquainted with that. And I want to teach this like a Sunday school lesson because it's Sunday. Notice, then this 
uh, word being a seed. But remember, the, the seed is only bringing forth a new life when it dies, and that's the reason it was so hard for those Pharisees to understand our Lord Jesus Christ, because they were under the law. And the law had, was the Word of God in seed form. But when the Word was made flesh and become not law, but grace, now, grace and law cannot exist at the same time, because grace is so far above law, law not even in the picture. And therefore, it's so hard for the Pharisees to die to their law so that grace could be born. But it must go. The two laws cannot exist at the same time. There cannot be a law that says that you can run this semaphore, and the other says you can run it. One says you can, one says you can. It has to be one law at a time. Maybe one time you could have went through it. Caution, go through it. But this time, it's red, stop. And so there cannot be two laws exist at the same time. Now, we notice that it always, my thought now to you, it takes pain, distress, discomfort. Look how them Pharisees died to that law. Through pain, distress, discomfort. But it must be. Now we find that rain, which brings forth fruit upon the earth, it's born, as the poet said, in the fields of thunder and a ragged, jagged skies. But if we didn't have the thunder and the ragged, jagged skies, the little distilled drop of rain that's been lifted from the seas and distilled from the salt, it would not be born. It takes that lightning, thunder, blast, ragged, rugged, fearful thing to bring forth the soft petal drops of water. It takes pain to bring forth birth. It takes dying. And as the clouds die, Rain is born because rain is a part of that cloud. One has to cease so the other one can exist. Now, my brethren here, some of them was able. They could give you all the laws of those things. I can't. But now, let's drop over to another thing just for a little proof. I think one of the prettiest flowers, everybody has their own ideas of them, but I think the prettiest flower that I've nearly ever seen is back in the east, our pond lily. How many ever seen a pond lily? Oh, there's just nothing like it to me. But did you notice what that pond lily had to be? I think of what Jesus said, consider the lily. How it toils and spins. But yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. For Solomon's glory and his arraignment was all artificial. But the lily in its beauty is life that's making it beautiful. Not some artificial uh, smear on, paint on, just like <laughs> our women. <laughs> I don't think you have to have all this green you know, and I, weakers, you know, out like that and all that and manicure or, or not. I get that stuff mixed up. All on your face to make you pretty? Pretty is as pretty does. If you add a little Acts 2 and 4, mix it all up together, the little John 3:16. It'll be anything that Max Baxter ever did try to fix. <laughs> Your husband will love you more. Everybody else will, and I'm sure God will. <laughs> Lily. He said, consider it. How it grows, toils, has to bring itself up. This little pond lily, look where it come through. Dirt. Muck. Mud, muddy waters, dirty waters. It pressed its way through all of that, this little germ of life. 
working itself from the bottom of the pond where the frogs and, and things are at. And then brings itself up through all of that. But when it gets in the presence of the sun, it's born. The little seed burst open into life. It cannot do that until it goes through all that process. It's got to come through that. That's what makes it. It's because that the sun itself is what's drawing it. And when it gets fully above all the dirty waters and muck and so forth, then it's so happy, it just gives its life out freely. And it's a beautiful life when it gets in the presence of that which is drawing it up. I think that's a beautiful type of Christian life. When something is drawing you out of the world until one day you're born right into its presence by the Holy Spirit. How beautiful. If you try to help it, you kill it. Like a little chicken when it's being born. You know, if you ever notice one of the little fellows right on top of his little beak or any bird that's born from an egg, it's, it's, got a, it's maturing this old uh, egg shell. The old inner parts of the eggs has to, to rot away. And it has to take this little beak and scrape back and forth until it breaks the shell out. We call it pipping its way out down in Kentucky where I come from. <laughs> pipping its way out. They have never found a better way. <laughs> Why? It's God's provided way. You try to help him, you'll kill him. Pick the shell off of him, you'll die. See, he's got to labor. Strain, break forth. That's the way a Christian has to do. It ain't somebody just shaking your hand, taking you in. You got to lay there till you die, rot, and are born into the kingdom of God. It's God's provided way. You don't go in by book or shake hand, or join, pump up, pull down. You you just simply uh, have to get away from the old shell. Notice. No better way have they ever found. They found no better way for a baby to get what it wants besides God's way for it. Now, when that little baby's born, you could um, set a bell down here beside his little crib. Say, my little son, I am a, a theologian in the way I've read books on how to raise a baby. And I tell you, you're a modern child. You've been born in a modern home by a modern parent. When you're hungry or need mother or I, just ring the little bell. <laughs> It'll never work. <laughs> the only way that it can get what it wants is to cry for it. That's God's way. And that's the way that we get what we want is cry for it. Cry out. Don't be ashamed. Say, I'm hungering for God. Amen. Don't care where the deacons, pastors, or whatever it is around. Scream out anyhow. The Joneses are sitting there. What difference does it make? <laughs> Cry out. That's the only way there is to get it. Until you get help. He taught that when he was here on earth, you know, about the unjust judge. A little dewdrop. I don't know the formula of it. Maybe there'd be a science share, but I'm just going to say a way I think. It might be a some kind of a congested group of atmosphere come together in a dark night. And it falls to the earth. And when it does, it's born in the night. But in the morning, it's laying there cold and shivering on a little uh, blade of grass or hanging on your clothesline. But just let the sun shine out once. Did you notice how happy it gets? It just glistens and quivers. Why? It knows that it's, that sunlight is going to draw it back to where it was at the beginning. And so is every man or woman that's born to the Spirit of God. There's something about it when light spreads over us. That we're happy because we know we're going back to where we come from. 
from the bosom of God. It can sparkle with joy when the sun hits it, of course. Knowing it's going to where it come from. Little crude things, but we could keep on with them. But let's find something else. We know the old seed is must before the new seed can come out of the old seed, it must rot. Absolutely not die only, but rot after it's dead. We know that to be true. That's the same thing in new birth. We never go back, but we go forward when you're born again. And that's why I think today we have so many, uh, not so many, rather, genuine new births is because the seed is maybe all well, sympathize with the word or the person, but they don't want to rot away from the old system that they were in. They don't want to come out of it. They want to stay in the old system and claim the new birth or the message of the age. We found that under the Luther, Wesley, Pentecostals, and all other ages. They still try to hold on to the old system and claim this, but the old system age must die. Rot in order to bring forth the new one. They still want to claim. Notice they know the old system is dead, but they just don't want to rot out of it. <laughs> now, rot is when it really is done away with. When a, a claim is made that they are newborn, but a claim is only a begotten sign, rotten brings forth the new birth. Got to rot away from it, just as we did in all ages through the Wesleyan and all forth. But the thing of it is, after that new birth is born, Wesley or Luther came forth with one word, the just shall live by faith. Well, he could not no longer cling on to the old system. He had to come out of it. And then when the Calvinists got the Anglican church in such a condition under the Calvinistic doctrine until God raised up an Armenian doctrine, which was John Wesley, the old system had to die in order for the new to come on. And when Wesley's age ceased and all the little ages or blades that come out on the stock of the apostle in Wesley's time, see, when Pentecost come out with the restoration of the gifts, they had to come out of Baptist, Presbyterian, Pilgrim Holiness, Nazarenes, Church of Christ, so-called, and all that, they had to come out of it, run away from it, to accept the new birth. You're always called crazy. But it's, as I, Paul said, when he rotted out of what he uh, once claimed, he said, in the way that's called heresy. That's the way I worship the God of our fathers. In the way that's called heresy. See, he'd accepted the new life that the Old Testament had given birth to the new. And he had to rot away from the old just make it a shadow in order to be. That's just where we are at now. Now, bear with me, but that's my idea. The churches has got so systematically till you can't get into one unless you belong to one. You've got to have a fellowship card or some kind of a identification. And by believing this, the only door I nearly have open is these businessmen. And as long as they're not an organization, I can go in with them but and get to bring the message that I feel that's on my heart to the people. But it's done so systematically, and I love you Pentecostal people, and Pentecost is not an organization anyhow. You just call yourself that. Pentecost is an experience and not a denomination. But you see, the thing of it is it's so hard for many men when they look at it and believe it and see it so identified by God in the Word, yet it's so hard to rot away from that thing you've been in. What would I do? Where would I get my meal? What? God is your meal. God is the thing for you to hold on. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I'll leave it, lay it there. You know what I'm talking about. We are told by God's prophets that we are to have a new earth. 
a new heaven and a new earth. If you want scripture, that's Revelation 21. I could quote it for you. Have it here. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth was passed away. It was gone. Now, if we're to have a new earth, the old earth and the new earth cannot exist at the same time, or the new world, the old world, cannot exist at the same time. There can't be two world orders together at the same time. Now, in order to get the new earth, the old one has to die. Now, if the old one has to die, then it's giving birth pains for a new one now. And then if a doctor went to examine a patient that was in uh, labor, now the, one of the things that doctor would do, which I'm talking in the presence of two or three, I know of good medical doctors here, Christian doctors. And I, I, I would ask you this. One of the first things that doctor does after he's been watching the patient is to time the pains, birth pains. He times the pains, how close they are together, and how much more terrific each one gets. One is more harder to have than the other one. Next one, still harder. Get closer together. That's the way he diagnoses the case, by the birth pains. Well, if the world has to give away to the birth of a new world, let's just examine some of the birth pains we're having on the earth. And then we'll see about what day and it's about how far she is along in her labor. The first world war showed great pain, birth pains. It showed one of the first birth pains of her going into labor. Because of that time for her, we had brought forth the bombs and we had uh, uh, machine guns and poison gas. And you remember, maybe many of you cannot, I was just a little boy of about eight years old, but I remember them speaking of this mustard and chlorine gas and so forth. How it just looked like it just get started and they said it would burn up the whole earth. It'd kill everybody. Well, it might be a, a, a breaking of that. Just winds blowing across the earth and how everybody was scared to death of that great weapon of poison gas. The earth went through her, its first birth pains. And we find out now we've had a second war, world war. And her pains was much greater, more terrific all the time, the birth pains of the earth. She almost had to give away during the time of the atomic bomb because it would destroy a whole city. It was much greater than the pains of the first world war of destruction to the earth. Now... She knows that her time of deliverance is at hand. That's the reason she's so nervous, frustrated as she is, is because that there is a hydrogen bomb and missiles of the air that could destroy the whole world. One nation is scared of the other, no matter how little it is. They've got those missiles that they claim will just one of them. They can direct them by the stars and drop them anywhere in the world they want to. Russia... As I heard on news the other day, she claims that she can destroy this nation and, and keep the atoms or the uh, things from breaking up her nation. We don't know what to do about it. Everyone's making these claims, and it's so. People, is, science has broke into God's great laboratory until they're going to destroy themselves. God lets always, that's wisdom, destroy himself. God doesn't destroy anything. Man destroys himself by wisdom as he did at the beginning taking Satan's wisdom and instead of God's word. Now, she knows she must give away. She cannot stand it. Russia, I believe, would destroy this nation today if she thought that she could destroy it and then preserve herself. Any of those little nations could do it. But they're afraid because they know that this world cannot stand in its orbit under such conditions. So the world knows that her birth pains is so great she's got to give away. There's going to be a new birth born at hand. I'm thankful for that. I'm tired of this one. Any, anyone knows that, that here it's a place of death and sorrow and all kinds of discrepancies and so forth. I'm glad that she has to give away and I'm glad that time is at hand. 
As John said of old, even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, she must rot, of course, as I have said, in order to bring new birth. Look what she's rotted into. Notice, my brethren, she's totally rotten. Her politics and systems are just as rotten as they can be. There isn't a sound bone in her, in her world systems. Her politics and her religious politics and whatever it is, one says, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist. Well, the whole thing's rotten to the core. There's got to be something give away. She can't stand if you put a George Washington or an Abraham Lincoln in every county in this United States. It still couldn't come back. It's beyond redemption. There's only one thing can help her. That's the coming of the Creator. Amen. She knows she must give away. She's in pain and distress. One don't know what to do. One's looking this way and one that way and everything. One's scared of the other. One trying to do something to destroy this and this and trying to contradict that and destroy the other. Until now they've got it in the hands of sinful man who could destroy a, the whole world in a five minutes time. See? So she knows she can't stand it. The people know she can't stand it and the world knows that they're going to, it's going to happen. For God said it was. The whole heavens and earth is going to be on fire. It's going to be a renovation of the whole thing so the new world can be born. God has prophesied it. She's rotten in all of her systems and she's got to do that to rot away. That's why she, I said she's so nervous and red in the face and flustrated and earthquakes everywhere and up and down the coast and tidal waves in Alaska and shaking up and down the coast of earthquakes and things and people writing, shall we leave it, shall we leave it? See, they don't know what to do. There's no safety zone but one. That's Christ, the Son of the living God. And there's only one thing that is a safety zone, and that's Him. All outside of there will perish. This is certain as God said so. Now let's look at the doctor's book, if she is in this kind of a condition, and see if this is supposed to happen when the new earth is to be born. Matthew 24, in the doctor's book, which is the Bible. And let's see what's prophesied. What are symptoms of being? Now, if a doctor knows the symptoms of birth of a child, and just about time the child's to come, he gets everything ready because he knows that that is the, um, the time the child's to be born because all symptoms shows the, the water's broke, the blood, and now the, it's time the child's dropped, it's, it's time for the child to be born. And so he gets everything ready for it. Now, Jesus told us just exactly what would take place just at this time. He told us in Matthew 24 that the church, true church, and the other church would be, church natural, church spiritual, would be so close together, impersonators, until it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. How that it was in the days of Noah, how there's eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and all this uh, immorality of the world that we see today, the Bible, the book, the doctor's book said it would happen. So when we see this happening, we know that the birth is at hand. Amen. It's got to be. Yes, sir. Now, we look at that as, as a nation, as a, not a nation, but a world. Now, Israel, the church, let's start back with her a few minutes. And let's follow her for the next ten minutes, maybe. Israel had birth pains under every prophet that came to the earth. She had birth pains at his message. For what did he do? The prophet had the word. And, um, and she had sown so much rottenness and made so much systematic orders in her being until this prophet shook her off of her foundation. They were hated. By everybody. So therefore, when God sent a prophet, the church itself went into birth pains because the prophet, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet and him only. That is the word that's spoken for that day is made manifest by the prophet of that age. Always has been. And the church has built so many systems around the word until he shook her off her rocker when he come. She had birth pains. What was it? Back to the Word. Back to the life. Systems doesn't have a life. It's only God's Word has life. Yeah. The systems that's built around it. 
Will does not have life. It is the Word that gives life. His message rocked the remnant back to the Word. A little group would come out and believe. Sometimes maybe in Noah's time only about eight people. But anyhow, God rocked the remnant and destroyed the rest of it. It had to rock away. It did that all down through the ages until finally the church delivered to them a man-child. And that man-child was the Word itself made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He conquered every devil, every power upon the earth that come against him with the Father's Word only. Every temptation that Satan gave him, he rebuked Satan, not with his, his own powers that he had, but with the Word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written, for he was the Word. When Satan flew against Eve, she wasn't the Word, so it failed. When he flew against Moses, it did the same thing. But when he hit into this Son of God, he was 10,000 volts that knocked the loose feathers out of him. When he come back and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There was that man child made flesh, God's eternal word himself manifested in a body of flesh on earth to represent the word. That's how he knew what was in their hearts. That's how he could tell Philip where he was, who he was. He could tell Simon Peter who he was, told the woman at the well. Why? He was the Word. Right. The Bible said in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the Word of God is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword, uh, cutting asunder even to the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Why those blinded Pharisee priests couldn't see that that was the Word made manifest. Or oh, they'd wrapped up into a priesthood and a system, and the old system had to give away. It was the word, but what had been promised had been fulfilled. So if it's fulfilled, it's got to rot away. It's the hall, the seed went on. If Moses could not have brought uh, Noah's message. Neither could Jesus have brought Noah's message, because it was another age. And the old seed was right, but it served its purpose and was dead and gone on. The transformation from the old to the new. Where the life was at was what was worrying the people. What worries them yet today? We're not building a wall like we start off with Luther's message, go right down a straight line or a Pentecostal message. Right? We are turning a corners. We're building a building. God's word is the blueprint. Anybody can run a straight line, but it takes a mason to turn the corner. It takes the power of God to do that. It takes an anointed one from heaven to be sent down to do that. It has in every age. Yet in the prophet's age, the word of the Lord comes to those prophets, and they turn those corners, made those differences. But the builders wanted to build a wall. It's not a wall at all. It's a building. A building of God. Now, we feel and know that this is the truth, that the systems was rock in every age, and every one of their systems had to rot and die out until... She brought forth that church out of that rotten mess, came forth the word itself. The word of the Lord come to the prophets. Never come to the priest. It come to the prophets. And notice, and when it did, finally, that word altogether was born here in human flesh. The fullness of the Godhead bodily rested in him. He was the Word. The prophets is part of the Word. The Word for their age. We today are part of the Word. Who follow the Word. But He was the entire fullness of the Word. He was the Word. He said, when they was accused of him making himself equal with God because he was the Son of God, they said to him, will you make yourself God? He said, isn't it written in your laws that you called those who the word of God came to God's, the prophets, and they were? Then how can you condemn me when I say I am the Son of God? Where the fullness of the Godhead bodily rested in the Son of God. He was the full manifestation of God. That's what finally the birth pains under those prophets 
while them being the word, they pointed to that fullness of themselves, the fullness of the word. And then finally, the systems died away until the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Watch how it was portrayed in Jacob. Watch how it was portrayed in Joseph. Exactly loved of his brother, his father, hated by his brother without a cause. He was spiritual, could foretell things and interpret dreams. And he couldn't help being that. He was just born that. He was predestinated to be that. But was hated by his brothers and finally sold him for 30 pieces of silver, almost 30 pieces, and was raised up, set at the right hand of Pharaoh, look in his prison. There was a butler and a baker. One was lost and one was saved. Jesus in his prison on the cross. One was lost, one was saved, exactly, and then exalted into heavens and set down on the throne of God. And when he shall leave again, there will be a sound go forth, bow the knee. And every tongue confessed, and when Joseph left the throne and started forward, a trumpet sounded, and every knee had to bow. Joseph was coming. So someday the great trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to this word. But what's he coming after? What's he coming here for? Notice, she brought forth this complete word which was made flesh under birth pains of the prophets that blasted out, he's a coming, he's a coming, he's a coming. Now, but she was without a prophet for 400 years according to history and the scripture from Malachi until John. They only had theologians, priests, pastors, now, here we can imagine without that what kind of a rotten condition her system must have been in. 400 years without a message direct of thus saith the Lord from God. So the priests, prophets, and so forth had got it into an awful mess. She was rotten. Then John, the promised Elijah of Malachi 3, not Malachi 4, Malachi 3, because Jesus said the same thing and and Matthew, the 11th chapter, when John's eagle eye got filmed over, as I believe Pemberman's early ages expresses, and he said, go ask him if he is the one or should we look for another? See? And he said, Jesus, after sending his disciples back, after telling them to stay at the meeting and watch what happened, and go show John these things, that blessed is he's not offended. He turned and looked to the, his disciples and the people he was speaking to. He said, what did you go out to see when you went to see John? He said, did you go out to see a man in soft raiment? And he said, I say unto you, that's the kind that stays in king's palaces. He said, did you go out to see a, a, a reed that was shaken by the wind? In other words, every little stain come along, he shook by it. I'll tell you, if you just come over and join our group, we can give you a better salary. Not John. If you just won't preach against this and that, well, you can join in our groups. Not John. Said, then what did you go out to see? A prophet? And I say unto you, more than a prophet. For if you can receive it, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet, saying, I'll send my messenger before my face to prepare the way. That's Malachi 3 1. Amen. Not Malachi 4 at all. That's a different, because that Elijah come, the world's to be burnt immediately, and the righteous walk out on the ashes of the wicked. Now, notice, his message never stirred them very much from their ecclesiastical sleep. They just said, there's a crazy man down there passing by, soon call himself crazy, he's trying to drown people down there in water. See? Why, there's nothing to that old man, why he don't even have on right kind of clothes. He's got a sheepskin wrapped around, why he's as poor as Job's turkey, why, what seminary did he ever come out of? What fellowship card? We'll not even cooperate in his meetings. We'll just let him stay down there and starve it out. The world hasn't changed very much. Neither has the systems. But we'll just let him stay down there. You don't have any. You know why he didn't? Remember, his father was a priest. But why didn't he follow the line of his father, which was custom for the children to do in those days? Because he had something too great a message. He was to introduce the Messiah. For the Holy Spirit had said so. That little remnant that had been brought back by the message of Gabriel down there knew that that would be so. So we're told about nine years old, he went to the wilderness after losing his father and mother, that he went into the wilderness because he had to hear exactly. Because in that great big theological uh, building there, they said, Now, I know that you're supposed to be the one to announce the Messiah. Isaiah said you was coming. So you are going to be that voice. Now, don't you think that Brother Jones here just beats that just exactly? And he'd be easily persuaded. But he never learned any of their systems. 
His message was too important. He went out into the wilderness to stay. Notice his message. It wasn't like a theologian. He used types. He said, oh, you generation of snakes. <laughs> Calling those clergymen. Snakes. The, one of the bad things that he had found in the wilderness, one of the sneaking things, was snakes. And he thought that's just about the best comparison I know. He said, you generation of vipers. Who's warned you from the wrath to come? Don't begin to say we belong to this and that. For God's able these stones to rise, children of Abraham. Amen. These stones, what he found in the wilderness and on the creek bank. Also the axe, what he used in the wilderness. Laid to the root of the tree, what he saw in the wilderness. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit. You know where he got his firewood, see? It's hewn down and cast into the fire. Made firewood out of it. See, his message wasn't a clergyman at all. It was after nature in the wilderness. But he had the message to announce and had the yes. faith in his message to say, that Messiah is so close to coming until he's right here among you now. Yes. I say unto you, there's one standing in the midst of you that you know not, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Yes. Who is he, John? I don't know. But one day there come a young man walking down to the river ordinary looking man just said oh John the Baptist was standing over there the blessed old prophet and he looked across the Jordan he said behold there's a lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world how do you know him John he in the wilderness that told me to go baptize the water said upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending he is the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost his message couldn't come from a theological standpoint or some man-made creed system. It had to come directly from God. Boy, his message didn't shake him very much. They thought, oh, he said he saw that. I doubt it very much. I didn't see it. I looked all my, I couldn't see nothing about it. The priest them said, but he saw it. And we know now he saw it. Sure he did. But you notice what it got? It never stirred them out of their sleep. They went right on, cut his head off, just the same. But it... It never stirred them, but it did get the remnant, the one that had the life in them. That little bunch, Ann and, and Simeon, and a few of those that were waiting all for the coming of the Lord. And Anna in the temple, blind, a prophetess that served the Lord by prayers. And then one day when she was in the spirit, and Simeon had prophesied, and said, an old man, he said, the Holy Ghost told me that I will not see death until I see the Lord's Christ. Well, some of the priests, you know, said, poor old fella, he's just a little off, you know. Why, well, he's got one foot in the grave now and the other slipping. Why, well, just let him alone. He's been an honorable old man, but he's kind of... But you see, what did he have? It was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. That's the same thing that is revealed to you people this afternoon. The Holy Ghost... Brought you here for some reason. The, some, the Holy Spirit. Look at these priests and clergymen here from Methodist, Baptist, Catholic and all. They was moved by the Holy Ghost. The hour's here. So the Holy Ghost moved on them. And they've been looking for it, hungering. Then just in the, one day, they don't, didn't have television, thank the Lord, for that day. So they, uh, they was down up on the hillsides of Judea. There was a, a baby born. A star appeared and so forth. But after eight days, the mother brought the little baby in wrapped in swaddling cloth. It's swaddling cloth, I'm telling, told that was a, they didn't have nothing to put on it. It was a, a little uh, a rag off of a yoke of an ox, I'm told, that was a swaddling cloth. And here come Joseph, the man coming in with this little baby. I'd imagine the mothers uh, stood back from a distance with their little babies with needlework and everything. Said, look at there, see? See, there she is. See, she was pregnant by that man. Here she comes in. Dead. Stay away from her. Keep your distance. They still think the same thing. But Mary, with that baby in her arms, it didn't make any difference what they thought. She knew whose son that was. And so is every believer that accepts God's word into their heart. I don't care what the system say. You know what it is. But the promise of God, it was revealed to you by the Holy Ghost when you were overshadowed with His power. You know where it's at. No man has a right to preach the gospel until he's met God back on the backside of the desert 
and that burning bush to where there's no ecclesiastical system in the world can explain it away from you. You were there. It happened to you. I don't care what the system say. You are a witness of it. Hallelujah. I feel like that old colored man I was talking about. I ain't got room up here now. See, I feel very religious at this time. When I think of that's right, God himself revealed to you. Simeon had the promise. Setting over his study that morning. Oh, I guess it might have been several hundred babies brought in every morning. About two and a half million Jews in the country. These babies come in, many born. Every eight days the mother had to come offer, offering for purification. Now here come Simeon sitting there, you know, maybe reading the scroll of Isaiah. I don't know. But all at once now, if the Holy Ghost has made you a promise, the Holy Ghost has got to keep that promise. Yes, amen. If it's really God, he, if, he, if a man comes to you and says a certain thing, God doesn't back it up. It isn't scripture to begin with. Forget it. And if he says it's so, and God still doesn't back it up, it's still wrong. Because God interprets his message. He's his own interpreter. What he says comes to pass, then God said, hear it, for it's the truth. That's only common sense. If he says it happens and it happens, that tells it. It must be every time that's exactly the truth, because God don't tell lies. And so, man, you're Simeon, sitting there, taking the persecution. He was the remnant. He'd heard John and the little remnant of that day. And here he was sitting there, uh, listening to this scroll, knowing, I mean, knowing that John was coming, because he, he was part of the remnant, the word was revealed to him. And all at once, when that baby come into the temple, that was duty of the Holy Ghost to reveal it. It was there. So he moved by the Spirit, come out of the little study room. Right down through the hall. Hit that line of women. Coming right down along that line of women. Until he got down to where this little baby was. is all staying away from. Picked up the baby in his arms. Said, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And at that time, another one of the little elected in that day was Anna, a prophetess. She's sitting over there blind in the corner. Raised up blind. Here she comes. Led by the Spirit among all the women and the people crowding out the temple till she come right straight to where the Christ child was. If the Holy Ghost could lead a blind woman to him, what about a Pentecostal group that's supposed to have your eyesight? I won't go any farther. You know from there on. Notice. Oh, my. How oh, that, that church must have been in an awful mess again. It surely must have been in that day. But it rocked the little remnant, as I said. Now let's be honest. If we see that church in that condition today, haven't we arrived at that time again? Now just look at the things of promise of the Bible that would be going on in the church at this time. We see what's going on in the world, and we see it's at its end. Now let's look in the church. She, the church, had birth pains under Luther. Now, we know these seven church ages and seven messengers to them church ages, according to Revelations. Now, when Luther had to come forth, it certainly threw the church into birth pain, but it brought forth a Luther. That's right. After that, it got in trouble again, so it brought forth a Wesley. That's right. Got forth again, and it brought forth a Pentecost. Each of them, messengers of their age, rock the back to the word, the message of their age, the message of... According to the Bible, I've got to come in a book out on that, the commentary of the first four chapters of Revelations. Read it. As soon as we get it on press. And it proves beyond a shadow of doubt what Luther's message was, justification, what? Uh, sanctification is the next process in the natural birth. And then come the Pentecostals. Exactly. Now, notice, each age rocked the church and gave it birth pains. But what did they do? After the birth pains come, instead of going on with the word, they got a bunch of men together, and it's like the first one did. So exactly. Right after the rocking of the apostles, then we find her going off again, then we find out along come uh, uh, many of the other activists and many of the great reformers back in the beginning. Each age had done as you studied the pre nicaea Council, the Nicaea Fathers, and all back you find it all in there. Each age was rocked. Every time a messenger come forth with, Thus saith the Lord. Now... She is in the worst stage that, according to the Scripture, that she's ever been. Amen. We are in the Lady Ocean church age. A rich but blinded church age that don't know it. There was nowhere in the Bible that Christ was ever put out of the church but the Lady Ocean age. 
She's in the worst state. She's the rottenest she ever was. So I said, this queen have need of nothing and don't know that you're naked, miserable, blind, poor, and don't know it. Yes, sir. So I counsel thee, come by, I say for me, that I might open your eyes. And that'll, that'll certainly, the I say of God will certainly bring light to the church if it wants to open its eyes to what God has said. Notice quickly now. Now, she is in that stage beyond a shadow of doubt where in the Lady of see a church age. Now, her messenger is promised in Malachi, the fourth chapter. He's promised to do it. And the message is to bring back the word. Bring the people back to the word. Birth is to be, she's to be delivered of a new birth from, according to Malachi 4. In the church world today, there is two systems of work. And now listen real close. Now let's see if you're going to say amen on this. There's two systems working in the church world today. I'm going to get this off my shoulder and then I have it over with. We all know that. That's the word of God and the denominational system. There is the two systems at work. Just as it was Jacob and Esau. One after the spirit, the other after the flesh. And what is it? Esau and Jacob was fighting in the wombs of the mother even to the time they were born. And so is the denominationals and the word fighting one against the other. They have been since Luther first brought the first reformation. I hope that's simple enough that you can understand it. These men, if they pick up this and go out with it, they can make more sense to it. See, to bring it to a place you would, I just want to lay this seed. I hope they make it come to life. Notice See, it's always been that. That's the reason she's bearing birth pains because there's a fight in her. There's the Esau, just a man of the world, very religious, and uh, oh, he's all right, good fella, clean, moral, as far as I know of, but he don't know nothing about that birthright. He's born that way, he's shaped that way. And Jacob, I don't care what he is, he wants that birthright. He's a spiritual one. And them too today is in the womb of the church. There's a great big system trying to be formed called the World Council of Churches. And from the womb of the church is coming forth two children. You just weren't my word. The world's the world word must deliver the word bride church. The church has got to be delivered out of her a bride for Christ. Damn it, fell asleep in all ages. I'll make up that bride that come out on the word that they come out on. Like from your feet coming to your head. She gives you greater and more you have to have and so forth. As the body grows up, so does the body of Christ grow up. And then finally the head will come to it. The head of it will. Now, if we know it's because it's, it's all linked to the head. The head does the turning, pulling. But these systems will not grow out of that. Because it's a system and it cannot bring forth, a cucklebird cannot bring forth a bunch of wheat. But they're both in the same field, watered by the same water and the same sunlight. One is the Word. One is not the Word. Them two are fighting. They've been fighting since the First Reformation. And they're still fighting. Now, I don't have any farther on that, do I? Surely you know what I'm talking about. There we are. There you are. System, what system are you in? Just imagine now, if you were to live back in the other days under the jolting of God's prophets and words that come forth, what side would you want to be on back there? Well, you've got the same choice today. Amen. She's fixing to bring forth the perfect word back there, and the word's coming for the word bride as a, a woman is a part of a man taken from him, so the church will have to be a word-abiding church, every word of the Bible. Not systems, dogmas, or nothing added to it. It'll have to be an unadulterated, pure, virgin word. Amen. Right. And in the days of the light of Luther, when the church burst that Luther forced you one under pains, but he come forth to just shall live by faith. Yes. This is not the communion. Now we find out in under the days of John Wesley, she gave pains again, but there's, there's a Wesley born. But what did he do? Went right back like mother did. And under the days of Pentecostals, your fathers and mothers come out of that thing and hated it. They went out on the street, your mother with no stockings on, beating on an old tin can and talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and some old guitar. They lay out on the streetcar tracks, stayed all night in jail. 
And we were so starchy and went right back into an organization and made ourselves the same muck that draw their children back in if they come out of. They'd turn over in the grave. They'd be ashamed of you. I know that's hard, but it's the truth. You say, I thought you love people. If love isn't corrective, then how can you produce love? Love is corrective. And I do love the world. I'm, I'm zealous of God's church. And to see these systems, it's binding it down on their dogmas and it's rotting away. And God declaring His word to be the truth and still they hold on to it. Amen. That's, you know it's the truth, brother, sister. That's just a, that's a simple way of telling it. it. It isn't a breaking down of Greek and things, but it's a breaking down of showing common sense. Surely you can understand that two and two is four. See? Now, we know that that's right. Now, the word must produce the bride. But the old system has to keep its type. It has to produce an Esau who sold his birthrights. Here it comes. I feel it. I hope you don't think I'm crazy. Well, if I am, let me alone. I feel good this way. I'm better this way than I was the other way. I, I may be crazy to the world. I, I know where I'm at. I know where I'm standing. Look, it's going to produce a stillborn baby. An ecclesiastical system is going to bring all the denominations together to produce an Esau that hates Jacob. Amen. I hope you see it. A stillborn, dead denomination. All of them going together. Oh, word believers, give in to my message. Hear me. Not my message, but his message that he firmly declares to be the truth. You've got to choose from somewhere. You can't sit still after this. You've got to make your choice. You remember the other day down at the Westward Hole there, on that morning, on that breakfast, how the Lord let me show you that wheat hides come up through Luther, through West End Apostles and so forth, and little springs off every church represented in a stalk of corn, then went right down into that wheat as it was, and there was that little shuck looked just exactly like the real grain of wheat. When you go out and look, if you don't know your wheat, you'll say you got wheat there, but it's just a shuck. And then you open that shuck up, there's no wheat there at all. Way back as a little bud of life coming forth. You take a glass and look at it. And when Pentecost first come out, it was so close. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. What was it to do? A support to the grain. Is that right? Now the tassel, look here, the blade doesn't look like the grain that went in. Neither does the tassel, but it's a little more like it. And the shuck is a whole lot like it. But still it ain't the wheat. It's the carrier of the wheat. Don't you see how those messages has come with birth pains? But the life left right out of there to go to the next message. The life went right out of Luther into Wesley's message. Right out of Wesley's message into Pentecostal message. Now it's time again yes. to leave the shuck. What's the matter? There's nature in every form declaring that's the truth. Yes. Now you see why you think I'm crazy. Maybe I am, as I said. But there's something in me. I can't stop it. I never put it there. It never come to my own choosing. It's God. And He confirms it to prove that it's the truth. To make it the truth. Not as I have anything against Luther and Wesley, Pentecostals or Baptists or uh, whoever. Nothing against nobody. The systems is what I'm against. Because the Word's against it, not the man. Look at these priests and clergymen sitting here today. They wouldn't be here if they listened to the system. But they had the common audacity of the Word of God to step out and accept it. Hallelujah. It means praise our God. <laughs> it won't hurt you. It means so be it. I believe it. I believe and know that it's the truth. It's confirmed to be the truth. Someday you'll find out maybe too late. Now watch. Watch. The Bible said his wife has made herself ready at the end of the age. How did she make herself ready to becoming his wife? And what, did she, what kind of a garment she had on his own word? She was dressed in his righteousness. That's what it is, right? See? Vision. Notice just closing. I want to say this one thing just before closing. That's what led me to say this. As thus saith the Lord. If a man would say that without putting it in his own thinking, he would be a hypocrite and should go to hell for it. That's right. If he'd try to get a bunch of people, find people like this, and deceive them. 
Why, he'd be a devil in human flesh. God would never honor him. You think God would honor a devil or a lie? Never. See, it goes over the top of their heads. And they don't get it. He pulls the elected out. Look at all the prophets through the age how he got the elected. Look coming down through even to the Reformation, like uh, the Roman Catholic Church burnt Joan of Arc to a stake for being a witch. That's right. Later on they found out she wasn't. <laughs> she was the same. Of course, they done penance, dig up priest's body and throw them in the river, but, you know, but that don't settle it in the books of God. Amen. No! They call St. Patrick one, too, you see, and he is about as much as I am one. So we notice, look at his children, look at his place up, look at how many he killed, look on the martyrology and see how many was killed there. You see, it isn't so. But the claim of the people, that doesn't make it so. It's what God said and proves that is truth. Amen. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Now, we find out here about a few months ago, one morning, I was walking out of the house and a vision came. And I challenge anybody here that snowed all these years to say at any time that the Lord ever let me say, Thus saith the Lord, but what had happened. How many knows it's the truth? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Could anybody speak contrary? It's true. Don't pay attention to the messenger. Look at the message it is. Amen. That's what it is. It isn't that. Don't notice the little ball headed, you know, person. It's just a it's just a human being. And we're just all the same. But watch what's happening. That's what declares it. I was taken. Now I know people say all kinds of things, and we know that a lot of it's not right. I can't answer for what any man says. I got to answer what I say. And I can only say whether it's truth or not. And I, I I'm the one that has to be responsible for it, not what somebody else says. I can't judge no one. I wasn't sent to judge, but to preach the message. Notice, I was to have a, a preview of the church. And I was taken by someone who I could not see and was set up on like a stand. And I heard the sweetest music I ever heard. And I looked coming, and a bunch of little ladies about looked to be... Uh, Oh, some age around 20, 18, 20. And they all had long hair and was fixed in different dresses, type dresses. And they were marching just as perfectly in step with that music as it could be. And they went from my left going around this way. And I watched them and I looked then to see who was talking to me and I couldn't see no one. Then I heard a rock and roll band coming. And when I looked over to my right side, coming up this way, coming back, here come the churches of the world. And some of the, each one carrying their banner from where they were from. Some of the dirtiest looking things i ever seen in my life. And when the American church come up, it was the awfulest i ever seen. The Heavenly Father is my judge. They had on these tattletale gray skirts like one of these barroom girls. With no back on it up here, holding up like a gray looking piece of paper. And like hula dancing. Paint, short bobbed hair, smoking cigarettes, and twisting as they walked to rock and roll. And I said, is that the church of the United States? And the voice said, yes, it is. And when they passed by, they had to hold it like this and put the paper behind them. When they passed by, I, I started to cry. I, I just thought of all my labor and all that I've done and everything that we ministers have worked together and brother, I, I don't know how much you believe about these visions, but it's truth to me. It's always proved to be true. When I seen that and knowing what was going on, my heart like to broke in me. What have I done? How have I missed it? I've stayed right with that word, Lord. And how could I have done it? I thought, why could you give me a vision not long ago and see me in there? And I said, well, well, they had to be judged. He said, Paul's group too. I said, I preached the same word he did. Christian businessman carried the article of it. And I said, Why? Why would it be like this? And I've seen that bunch of prostitutes going by like that, all dressed up like that, and called the church of Miss USA. And I was just fainting. Then directly I heard that real sweet music come again. And here come that same little bride coming by again. He said, this is what comes out. Of. And when she walked by, she's exactly like the one was in the first place. Walking to the step of the music of God's Word, Marching on by and went out of sight. I stood there with both hands up crying like that. I want to come to a stand on my porch out there looking around across the field. 
What? She's to be the same bride, the same kind, built out of the same kind of material that she was in the first place. Now read Malachi 4 and see if we're not supposed to have a message in the last days that will turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, back to the original Pentecostal message, word by word. Brothers, we are here. Now, this church is supposed to get a sign. And its last sign, uh, we find out here in the, in, in, the, in the Scripture, see now, see, the great birth pains is being in this lady of sin age. It's boring. Their church is being born again. Not will never be another organization. Anyone knows that every time a message went forth, ask these historians. After a message went forth, an organization come up out of it. Oh, Alexander, Camel, everything else, Martin Luther, and everything. They made an organization out of it. And usually a message only goes for about three years, a revival. This has been going for 15 years, and there's been no organization come from it. Why? The shuck was the last. We're at the end. See the birth pains? See what's the matter? Just a remnant will be brought out. Just a remnant will be brought out. And that's why I'm crying and straining and pushing and laying aside every favor of man on earth to find favor with God and just moving on in His work. She's in pain. That's what's the matter. She's going to give birth. She must make her choice. The handwriting's on the wall. We see the earth is just about ready to go. That's right. And we see the church. She's so rotten, she's about ready to go. And the birth pains is on all of it, on both the world and the church. And there's about to be a new world born and a new church born to go to it for the millennium. We know that. Look, God gives her, and listen to this post, and I'm closing, her final sign, her final message, her final sign. Her final sign is she has to get the conditions like she was at the beginning. The world, the church, look how it was in the beginning. All them years without, from Malachi until Jesus. Look at it all the years now. Look at it all back in there with corruption that got into it. Look at the earth, how it was on each time, like the days of Noah, so forth. has to be in the same kind of a type, and we see that as it was in the days of Noah. We see all these things just pattering up. Then we get one final sign. In Luke, the 17th chapter, the 28th verse, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Or as it was in Sodom, see? Now, Jesus read this same Bible, the same Genesis we read. Now, close. Don't miss it. The same Bible we read, Jesus read. And he said to his church, look back and see when the days of Sodom returns again. Perverted people. Man losing their natural, look at the homosexual, how it's on the increase across the world today. A uh, newspaper just recently. If you ought to get in my office and read letters from mothers for their boys. And homosexual is on in the increase of, I think it's 20 or 30 percent in, in California alone over last year. A great bunch of the, of even government people has proven to be homosexuals. You government men know that. In your magazine. I read it. And in the different things that's taken place, if you...
understanding of the scripture that's exactly what God said would take place that him is speaking the tongue also pray that he may interpret that be true I've told you truth then God's here confirming it it's the truth that's true now look what was that last message that Jesus said as it was in the days of Sodom now watch just before the, the Gentile world was burned up the fire now, try to understand what happened? There was a bunch of people, lukewarm church members, like Lot and his group, down in Sodom. There was another man that had already come out of it. He wasn't in it to begin with. That was Abraham, the one that had a promise of a coming son. You understand? Say amen. amen. All right. And now just before the climax of the destruction came, God appeared to Abraham in many forms. But this time he appears as a man. He was a man. And he come up to God. Now you say it wasn't a man. It, it, it was God in the man. Abraham called him Elohim. It was a man. And look, he sat down with his back turned to the tent. And he said, where's Sarah, your wife? She said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life that I made your promise. And Sarah laughed. And he said, why did Sarah laugh? See? Now that's what was going on in that day. Just to show the last sign that Abraham saw, the elected group pulled out away from Sodom. Now, don't miss this parable, whatever you do. The group that had been pulled out, it wasn't in Sodom to begin with, but two of the angels went down into Sodom. And when they got down there, we find Lot. And he found him in a backslidden condition. Horror, homosexuals, and perversions, you know the story. But there's one that stayed with Abraham, was Elohim. They preached the word down there. Preaching the word, smited and blind. And they couldn't find the door. That's what it is today. But the one that was with the group that was pulled out, done a miracle before Abraham to show that who he was, and was with Abraham. He said, why did Sarah laugh concerning this baby? And Sarah come forth and said she didn't and said, but you did. And he would have killed her right there if she wasn't a part of Abraham. So would God slay us if we wasn't a part of Christ. The mercy of Christ all holds us together, us doubters and perversions in the word. But notice, notice what happened. Jesus turns back around now and says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the end time when the Son of Man begins to reveal himself. See? Son of man always in the Bible is a prophet. Amen. See, he come in three sons' names. Son of man, son of God, son of David. See? And he pronounced his name son of man because that's the work he done of a prophet. Seer. And he said, in the days, as it was, no, when the son of man begins to reveal himself, that will be the time of the end. Now, let's just think just for a minute. Never has the world had a messenger over the world. We've had Finney, Sankey's, Moody's, Finney, Knox, Calvin, so forth. All around the world, messengers to the church in these birth pains. But never did we ever have a man going out with an international message until this day with his name ending in H-A-M. A B R A H A M, which is six letters. A B R A H A M is seven letters. We got one today, and it's G R A H A M, six letters. And six is the number of the world, creation day. When did the world ever have a man down into it now, preaching down in the cosmos, down there in the world, down there calling the people out, repent, repent, perish, or come out of it, until this age? G R A H A M. Look what he's doing, preaching the word. Blinding the outsiders. Call him, come out. A messenger from God. Jesus said that would take place. Amen. Just when the Son of Man will reveal himself. Now, that, where's that at? Out there in the church orders. World. 
And they began to hate the man for it. But remember, there was a group also that was a spiritual group, the Jacob group, not the, not the Esau group. There's a Jacob group was looking for the son that wasn't in that Babylon. And they received a messenger. Amen. Yeah. You understand? Amen. Abraham, A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Amen. They received a messenger. And that messenger, what was the great outstanding thing he'd done to show that his at the end time? He discerned the thoughts that was in Sarah's mind. And Jesus, the Son of God, which was made flesh, showing that the Spirit of God would come back down in that little elected group of, at the end time and would reveal Himself in the same manner. Amen. Birth pains. Amen. Oh, brother, please try to understand. Try hard. Open up your hearts just a minute. Look to Christ. That same God's right here now. That same one. He promised these things. And if He promised them, He certainly is able to do them. Let's bow our heads just a minute. I want you just to think Solomon. Father, it's in your hands now. I've done all I can do. I pray that you'll help the people to, to understand. Seeds been planted. Pour the water of the Spirit up on it, Lord. And water for your glory. If I made a mistake, Lord, I didn't mean to. I pray, God, that, that you'll interpret it right to their hearts. That they might see and understand Grant it, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. I love you. This God that preached this word, this God that's responsible for this word, I'm only responsible for saying it. He's the one that has to quicken it. That same God is here. Now, how many out there has a need? Raise your hand. Did he promise to do these things yes. in the last days? Now you look to me. Now it's like Peter and John said, look on us as if, see, he told them. Now you look this way. Now please don't move around. This is a very, I'm, I'm trying my whole heart within me. Just be real reverent. See, each one of you spirit, when you move, of course, you're a unit. And I'm trying to catch faith of the people. A little woman passed by and touched his garment, went out and sat down. Jesus told her what her troubles was and she was healed. And now he promised to do that again. The Son of Man would reveal himself like he did at Sodom. The world's in that condition. The church is in that condition. Now has God kept his word? Let's see if he has or not. Oh, we've had signs, jumping, speaking in tongues, prophecy, so forth. But wait, there's another sign. Oh, we have many carnal impersonations. That This makes the real one shine. Any bogus dollar should make the real one shine. Now you pray. You believe. Just, I, I challenge you to do that. You look and believe what I've told you. How many believe it to be the truth? I care who you are, where you are. I just, everyone in here, as far as I know, is a total stranger except Bill Dow and his wife sitting right there as I know. I think I know this little preacher here from Germany sitting there and brother, and two, three people sitting right there. Somebody back over in the audience, look, way back. I challenge you to believe what I've told you is the truth. How about when that angel of the Lord came down on the river yonder 33 years ago and made this remark? How did I know when my own Baptist pastor turned me out of the church? He said, you, you had a nightmare, huh, Billy. I said, a nightmare, nothing, Dr. Davis. That's the way you, the attitude you take. You might as well take my fellowship card. I know there'd be somebody somewhere who would believe it. God wouldn't send a message unless there'd be something to receive it. Oh, sure, when I went forth praying for the sick, it was very fine. But when I begin to tell you the truth of the word, and it's different. You ought to know every message had been that way. Jesus was wonderful when he went in the church and healed the people and everything. But when he sat down one day and said, I and my father are one. Oh, that, that did it. <laughs> Lest you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. He didn't explain it. He wanted to see who would stand by him. That's right. What do you think a, a crowd with doctors and things says? That man's a, why well, he's a vampire. 
eat his flesh and drink his blood. He never explained it. He never explained it. But still, that word was holding those apostles. They didn't care. They didn't understand it. They believed it anyhow. They know because it seen the works of God and they know it was. He said, They are they that testify me. Here's a man, woman sitting right here. Got her hand up. Now you can call me a fanatic if you wish to, but that same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness is right over that woman. Now remember, Jesus said, A little while in the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me. I come from God, I go to God. After his death burial, he told the Jews, he said, I, he was that rock that was in the wilderness. He was that pillar of fire. I am that I am. Who was I am, that pillar of fire and that burning bush? Is that right? And it was made flesh and dwelt among us that I come from God and return to God in order to return in the form of the Holy Ghost. And here he is with us today. Scientific pictures taken of it. Here he is to prove more than any scientific picture or anything. He's here to prove it. For it's him, I, the Son of Man, will be revealed in this day. Now there he is. I'm looking right at it. You see, do you see John saw it too, but the rest of them didn't. Look to prove it now. That woman's a stranger to me. I've never seen her in her in my life. But she's got something wrong with one of her limbs that she's praying about. Is it? That's right, lady. You had an operation on it. That's your husband sitting next to you. You're not from here. You're from California. Your name's Roland. Your stomach troubles ended too, sir. You had stomach trouble, didn't you? Or it's all gone. Your legacy. And that day, the Son of Man here, sitting right back to here. There's a man. He's a colored man. Something wrong with his eyes. He's a uh, yes. He uh, his work he does. He does something about car polishes cars, car waxer. Right. Your eyes are going bad. You've just believed, haven't you? Some real strange thing happened to you. Your first name's Fred. That's right. Your last name's Con. That's right. You believe now? Your eyes ain't gonna bother you no more. <laughs> I ain't ever seen the man in my room. Man right back behind there. He's not from here either. He's from California. He's got a bad back. Mr. Owens? Lord Jesus, make you well. I've never seen the man in my life. Know nothing about him. I'm just following that light as it goes. If you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. The little fellow sitting here got a hernia. He's wearing glasses and a gray suit. Fred, God heals you if you believe it. Will you accept it? All right. I've never seen him in my life. Mrs. Holden, sitting over there from him, suffering with eye trouble. I know, know the woman, never seen her in my life. But that's true. See? If you can believe. What you crying for, sis? You've got a nervous breakdown. Bronchitis. Heart trouble. You believe that God will make you well? Sitting on the end of the seat there. If you believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ will make you well. And all that nervousness will go from you. You feel like you're back in your right condition. The devil's lying to you. You accept it? Or raise up your hand and say, I'll accept it. Okay, it's all over. What? This church is going through a birth pain. Why don't you make your choice now in his presence? I've showed you exactly the word, what he said he would do. Combing through this building, ask anyone that's ever been struck or talked or to or whatever it was, and see if I ever seen them, know them, or anything about them. You think a man could do that? That's totally impossible for that to happen. But what is it? The Son of Man. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, discerning of the spirit, the secrets of the hearts. Just exactly like it was when it was made flesh here on earth in the Son of God. Now it's been revealed by the Son of God as He's come to call a bride out of that system. Come out of it! Be separated, saith God. Touch not their unclean things. And God will receive you. 
Are you ready to surrender your whole life to God? If you are, stand up to your feet and say, I will, by the God's grace, accept it right now for everything that's in me. Hallelujah! Praise be to God! You believe Him? Then just raise your hands and pray with me. Confess your wrong. Birth pains. It's hard to die. But die right now. Die. Come out of your own unbelief. Come out of it. This is the Word of God made manifest. Just as it was when Jesus came on the earth. It's Jesus Christ again among you. Prove it. Abraham received the Son. Immediately the promised Son after that taken place. And Jesus is coming again. That's His Spirit. He's so close to the earth, so close to coming, that He's ready to receive you if you're ready to receive Him. Now raise up your hands and pray with me. Lord God, let all the priests hold on to the altars. Let the people cry out. May the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud move into the people today and sober them, Lord, to the realization of the presence of the living and mighty God. Grant it, Lord. Receive them. I pray this prayer for each one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Fill each one with the Holy Ghost who doesn't have the Holy Ghost. Lord, may the revival of this campaign, this meeting, break right now into a great powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. May the sick be healed, the blind see, the cripples walk. May the manifestation of the living God be brought into the presence of the people as it has been this afternoon. And may the people receive it in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask them. Raise your hands out and give me praise and receive what you ask for.